1 John 3 9. Boy, does this get misconstrued. I've dealt with this before, but it keeps coming up. It keeps rearing its ugly head. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Of course, what should you have done before you got here? Three guesses. Guess number one. Read 1 John chapter 1 and 2. Guess number two. Read John chapter 1 John chapter 1 and 2. Third guess. This one better be right. Read the first two chapters. It was resolved from the beginning. If you went back to 1 John 1, find out what it was all about. The letter. 1 John chapter 1. So we'll go a quick review of it. Who's in view in 1 John chapter 1? People say, oh, all people are in view here. Really? Well, let's go to 1 John 2 1 first. Because it ends the first chapter. NASB, 1 John. 2, 1. Now that's the first verse of the second chapter. The author John is saying, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now tell me this letter is to unbelievers. Tell me now. If, if, if it is unbelievers, then send a couple of chastising emails to me and tell me to shut up. My dear little children, John writes, Christ is our advocate. Christ is not the advocate of the unbeliever because the unbeliever hasn't believed in order to make Christ the advocate of that one that his sins are forgiven before God. Unbelievers don't have their sins forgiven. And so you may not sin. You don't tell believers don't sin. You tell unbelievers to believe. All right. There we go. <clears throat> So if we looked at 1 John chapter 1, subject is being in fellowship with God. Do unbelievers have fellowship with God? No possibility. You have to become a believer. <clears throat> so look at 1 John chapter 1. In the beginning, to verify what we just said, we're talking about believers. First four verses. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen out with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Who do you think that is? Jesus Christ. And the life was manifested and we have seen, these are the apostles, first century. We have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, that's Christ, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Made clear to us. Jesus Christ arrives, Son of God, in his perfect humanity. John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What we have seen and heard and we proclaim to you also. They're proclaiming their experience and their discovery of who he was and who he is so that you too may have fellowship with us. Oh, fellowship! Does it say salvation there? No! This letter is about having fellowship and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, the great apostles, author John, has fellowship with God the Father with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we, we write so that our joy may be complete, that you may have fellowship with us, one with another. We, the apostles, God, his Father, the Son, okay, and we with us, and you with us, fellowship with God. That's the subject. So it doesn't change when you get to 1 John chapter 3, does it? Yet yeah, people want to change it. You need to confess in order to have eternal life. Well, <clears throat> let's read the corporate verse, the, the culprit verse, 1 John 3, 9. Scrolling on down. So you have a handle on this already. We did a quick review. You should really study it through carefully to make sure that I concluded correctly, but I don't know how you can miss my dear little children, those aren't unbelievers. 
The verse leading up to 1 John 3, 9 happened to view the stark contrast, the stark contrast between the Son of God and his righteousness and the devil and sin as exemplified by potential acts of sin and righteousness by the children of God born of God. The battle is between. There's the context. The devil who sinned from the beginning, his works of originating sin, lawlessness and rebellion in himself and all of humanity against God, contaminating the whole human race and the world so that all of mankind are physically born with a sin nature which causes acts of sin. The contrast between that, the devil, and the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? That Jesus Christ, who is in his, in his humanity, was holy and perfectly born of God. Is that talking about you? No. Only one born of God, who is perfectly born of God, and remains absolutely righteous. Is this you? No. Who came to destroy the works of the devil and enable mankind to be saved by taking away sin, to enable each individual to trust in his, Christ's work, to receive eternal life, and thereafter abide forever in his righteousness. We can read the verses that lead up to this to get a handle on the context further. 1 John 2, 28, Now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have bold assurance and not shrink away from him in shame at his appearing. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who does acts of righteousness is born of him. That doesn't mean that if you don't do righteous, you're not born of him, by the way. But you can recognize the friend of God like what Abraham did, right? Now, sometimes people look at fellow Christians and don't know if they're a friend of God or not. Behold, how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So therefore, we're imperfect. So can you claim to have sinless perfection and act with righteousness all the time? No. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. That's when we'll be like him. Perfect righteousness we will have in our experience. Because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Keep your eyes on Jesus and his righteousness. You recognize how far short you fall of that. And God purifies you from all unrighteousness. Through the grace of God, not through your beautiful acts of sinlessness. You have very few of them. None at all, really. Everyone who does sin also does lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. That's your, that's your nature. You know that he appeared, Christ appeared, manifested in the sense of God incarnate, in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So look to him. Isn't this a message? 1 John 3, 6. Everyone who abides in him does not sin. Can you not sin? How do you abide in him? Recognize his perfect... See, he says, everyone who does... You know that he appeared, manifested the sense of God, in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So you're looking to him, right? We know that when he appears, we'll be like him, because we'll all see him just as he is. We're looking to him, not to our own behavior, which is imperfect. Get your eyes off that yourself, and get your eyes on Jesus. Everyone who abides in him by getting your eyes on Jesus does not sin as you're doing that. By the grace of God, everyone who sins has not seen him nor known him, the Son of God. You don't have your eyes on Jesus, then you don't know him. It just takes a second to get your eyes off of Jesus, and you don't know Jesus and his perfection. Why would you take your eyes off the perfect righteousness of God and put your eyes on temporal, moral, immoral matters like yourself? Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who does acts of righteousness is righteous, just as he, Christ, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. When you sin, you're of the devil. Most of the time we are. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Okay, who do you keep your eyes on? Not the devil, is saying, right? For the purpose, this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. So you can keep your eyes on him manifested in his absolutely perfect righteousness, that he might destroy the works of the devil through his righteousness that is attained by faith alone in him alone. When you look to him in faith, your righteousness is credited to your account, the righteousness of God. Now you have that credited to your account. Each one, here's the critical verse, each one who has been born of God 
that you or I. Really? No. He who is born of God does not sin, for his God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Again, we talked about the implication here. We are sinners, so we need to look to Christ. And we abide in him by looking to Christ and admitting our sins. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, believers, God is faithful and just to forgive us these sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We purified ourselves by confession of our wrongdoing, not by our good doing. Oh God, I've done so much good. I've been sinless. I don't even need you for the next minute or two. Wrong. So here, get rid of this idea that you do not sin. In view of the verses leading up to 1 John 3, 9, children of God, born of God, are to abide in him, so that when he appears, that we may have bold assurance at his appearing. If they know that he is righteous, they know that everyone who does acts of righteousness are born of him. Children of God will be like Christ when he appears again. Those who have this sure hope of being purified from sin as Christ is pure are themselves purified. Read it again. Those who have this sure hope of being purified from sin, resurrection body, in the future, as Christ is pure, are themselves purified by keeping your eyes on Jesus with the sure hope that because of what he did on the cross and your trust in him, you will have perfect righteousness in your experience as well as credit to your account for the moment of faith. But those who do sin, do lawlessness, he appeared to take away sins, and in him is no sin, and everyone who abides in him is purified of his sins. Everyone who sins is characterized as not having sin, seen or known him. So for those moments where you recognize your sins, you act as if you haven't seen him or known him. Believers, so quickly confess those sins and get placed back into fellowship with God. The one who does righteousness is characterized as righteous just as he is righteous. Can that be us? When we confess our sins, it is. He declares us. If we confess our sins, God is righteous and just to forgive us these sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let me jump back. Another verse, 1 John 1, 7. Take a look. This comes previous, so you can pull on it. It's chapter 1. But if we walk in the light of Christ, as he himself is in the light, Christ is perfect righteousness. So are we walking according to the light? The word is in, in the light. The light, the flashlight shines on stuff in the barn. And all of a sudden you see all the rats scurry away to the darkness. And all that's left is what you can see. And you shine the light on Christ, you see nothing but sinless perfection, absolute righteousness. When you see that, you walk in the light, let Christ's light shine on you. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, does what? Because he died on the cross for you, you get eternal forgiveness and it also cleanses you from all current, daily, temporal sin. We move on down. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. I don't have any sin. You're lying. There's sin in you. Any moment. Every moment. So, confess those sins. He is faithful and right, for righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right there it is. All unrighteousness. And if you say we have not sinned for a period of time, whatever it might be, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Your sinless perfection is contained within Christ. And it's being held for you until your resurrection comes. And the only way to get purification from all your sins is what? Confess our sins. Same thing as saying walk in the light of he, Christ's righteousness, who is in the light, is absolute perfection. And what do you get? The blood of Jesus cleanses his son. Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So let's move back. So, the one who is the one who does sin is characterized as of the devil. That's us, and from moment to moment, confess your sin, and now you're not of the devil. Because the devil is, a, is the one who has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God, on the other hand, we walk in his light. We don't always do that. You walk in the light.